It's a pleasure to be here to tell you what we uh, did two summers ago. Uh, I'm mainly going to be recounting uh, the discovery of LIGO's first neutron star merger and how we saw light for the first time from a gravitational wave event uh, and how we understand that light to tell us something fundamental about the origin of the heaviest elements uh, in the universe. And so we're really entering this new era where we're combining information from gravitational waves and traditional messengers like electromagnetic light uh, to, to probe the extreme physics of these mergers, some of the fundamental questions in nuclear astrophysics, and just get a better handle uh, on whether, you know, on how we understand these, these cataclysmic events. Um, and it's going to be an exciting time going ahead as we're able to do this more frequently. And what I'm going to tell you tonight about is our first opportunity to do this, which really turned out to be um, spectacular. Um, and so one of the questions that mo I work on several fields of astrophysics, but one of the questions that motivates me and, and people in this field is, is where do the elements uh, come from in nature? What is the astrophysical origin of the periodic table? Um, and this is kind of what it looked like, uh, the status of this, when I was in grad school in the 2000s. Um, we knew that the lightest elements, hydrogen, helium, and lithium, uh, those at the top of the periodic table, come from the Big Bang and the, the earliest minutes of our universe. Um, as you're looking at sort of the lighter elements like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, um, those can be produced in stars about the mass of our sun. Um, you know, as it evolves uh, through different stages in its core, it will first burn hydrogen to helium and then helium to carbon and oxygen. Um, you know, but even our sun, it will never actually get hot enough in its core uh, to burn any elements uh, heavier than oxygen. So as you go to elements uh, below, the, you know, excuse me, below, um, uh, below those on the periodic table, um, uh, below, below carbon oxygen, you have to go towards uh, more uh, massive uh, stars. Um, and, and, so, and so we actually understand that these, that these elements, you know, from oxygen up to iron can be produced in, in, in stars that are more massive than our sun and dispersed into space when those stars explode at the end of their lives as supernova. And, and how do we know this? Well, we can actually see it you know, directly. We can actually go out and see uh, supernova explosions that happened in our own galaxy. This is the Cassiopeia A remnant. Uh, it exploded in about 1667. If you were outside and we were the right part of, this, of, of, the, of the world, you, you could have seen this with your naked eye, probably. Um, and we believe that the original star that exploded uh, was about 17 times more massive than our sun. And what you're seeing here are the X-rays that are produced as the eject of the material, the outer layers of this star when it exploded, collide with the interstellar medium. Uh, the X-rays light up and show us uh, uh, important information on what material was dispersed by these explosions into space, which, of course, ultimately end up in the next generations of stars. And so, you know, by looking at different colors of the X-rays, we can directly see the imprints of silicon or sulfur or calcium or I iron. Uh, in the ejecta of this explosion. And so this is sort of the empirical basis for this famous Carl Sagan quote that the calcium in our teeth, uh, the iron in our blood, uh, the carbon in our apple pies were made in the interior of collapsing stars. When he says we are star stuff, this is uh, what it means. Um, and we have quite a bit of confidence in this, this basic picture where the lighter elements come from for, for quite a long time. Uh, but as you get to the bottom of the periodic table, uh, these are much uh, rarer elements. They're produced much less frequently in the universe. Um, and their origin is, is honestly less certain. And even though this, this periodic table says they were made in supernova, we, didn't know, we don't know if this is, is true. Um, but nevertheless, you know, if you go to the bottom of the periodic table, this includes the precious metals like gold, silver, and platinum and the transuranic elements. And you can imagine that you know, our society and culture would be very different if these elements existed in different abundances on the Earth than they do. And so it you know, behooves us to try to understand you know, where do you produce these elements in nature. And of course, it's a, it's a challenge. Uh, you can't produce these elements, uh, obviously, in stars. And one of the reasons is if you look at an iron nucleus, which we, we can produce, it's sort of the heaviest element you can produce in, in a massive star before it explodes. Um, it's mo you know, roughly half protons and neutrons in the nucleus. Um, and so it's an old problem, but if you look at a gold nucleus, it's actually uh, you know, substantially more neutrons than protons. And so this is a very old problem uh, going back to the Middle Ages of how you turn uh, iron into gold. And we're still wrestling with this uh, even now. Um, uh, but fundamentally, it's, it's, it's principle simple. You just take an iron nucleus and you bombard it with neutrons at a very high rate. And, it, and neutrons don't have to overcome the Coulomb barrier of the nucleus. So you don't necessarily need high temperatures to do that, but you need a very high abundance of neutrons if you want to turn iron into gold. 
But as you know, free neutrons are unstable. They decay into protons in about 10 minutes. And so where do you go in nature to find a very, very high abundance such that you could achieve the conditions that would be required to turn iron into gold? And of course, we do know of such objects that have a bunch of neutrons in them, and these are neutron stars. These are the cores. When the massive star explodes, the core uh, implodes into a neutron star, and the energy that's released is what explodes the outer layers of the star. Um, and in fact, in this Cassiopeia A image I showed you earlier in X-rays, you can actually see a little point source in the middle, a very hot central source, and that source is the uh, cooling uh, neutron star. So just to remind people in the audience who don't know, this is sort of a cartoon diagram. Um, but <laughs> essentially, uh, in very simple terms, a neutron star is what you get if you were to fit the mass of the sun into an object about the size of Queens. Uh, of course, I don't recommend showing this particular image uh, when you're going through security at JFK. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, it turns out neutron stars are not entirely. The reason that neutrons can't decay in, in, into protons is because it's so dense that the, you know, the, the, the decays are polyblocked. The, 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 you know, the, the electron Fermi C is full, so you can't uh, so you, so you're stable if you're a neutron. But nevertheless, there are some protons inside a neutron star. Um, and this is you know, some of the ext most extreme densities. So you have a, a macroscopic object which has a density which is higher than that in an atomic nucleus. Um, and so with the interiors of neutron stars are a very uh, exotic composition, we think, potentially. And it's, it's actually quite a, a frontier what, what's producing them. So I have to go through. I apologize for the experts in the audience, but I, I want to try to go through a, a few basic ingredients I have to explain to you before I can uh, tell you about this uh, discovery. One of them is just the fact that, as you're aware, in the early 20th century, Einstein revolutionized our theory of gravity. Uh, and and the, the simple, the simple uh, one-liner to explain it is basically to say that uh, you know, a satellite doesn't orbit the Earth. A satellite's going in a straight line, but the Earth has redefined what is a straight line. And so this is the famous uh, John Wheeler quote uh, to understand uh, this, this new definition of space-time, that, that mass tells space-time how to curve, and space-time tells mass how to move. Um, and so if you think about different objects that we've talked about so far, the sun and neutron star, these are, you know, the sun is massive but not particularly dense, and so it doesn't distort space-time around it particularly strongly. A neutron star is about as much as you can distort space-time without being a black hole. They're roughly twice the mass of our sun, but much more compact. And then if you're talking about black holes, these are the most you know, extreme uh, objects in terms of, of, of their densities and space-time uh, warpage. Uh, so so you know, space-time is so warped that not even light can escape from the vicinity. So, oh, OK, so the other point I want to make to you is that although our sun is a single star, uh, in fact, most stars have uh, binary companions. They're not a single star. You have two stars which are actually uh, orbiting uh, one another in a binary. And Luke Skywalker's planet, uh, he did have a, a binary star, so he gets to see two, two sun stars uh, set at, at, at night. Uh, but this is an you know, essential fact in astrophysics. We see you know, very frequently stars are not found uh, in singles. They're found in these binaries. And in fact, these uh, neutron stars, which I just described to you earlier, and black holes can also be found uh, in these binaries. Now, exactly how they get into binaries, exactly how uh, they stay in binaries is, 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 a, is an important open question. But nevertheless, it's a sort of empirical fact that these binaries exist. Um, and it turns out that if you have a, two compact stars that are in a binary and they're orbiting one another, uh, that they emit uh, something known as gravitational waves. This is ripples, if you will, in space-time. But the, the central way to understand it is that, um, well, I'm showing you here a movie, but let me just explain. So if the two objects that are, that are orbiting one another, that's a time-dependent quadrupole moment of inertia. And as a result, the, uh, the, 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 the gravitational waves are carrying away angular momentum and energy from the binary. Uh, but this is, a, you know, in some sense, a runaway process. You know, the stars are far apart. These gravitational waves are weak. But as they lose energy, that causes the binary to shrink, which means the, 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 or the, the rotation gets faster and faster through Kepler's law. The gravitational waves get stronger and stronger and cause the binary to merge faster and faster. And so if you have a sufficiently compact binary, then you know, over the course of, of a long period of time, it will eventually uh, uh, coalesce through the emission of these uh, gravitational waves, ultimately forming a single object, if you have, in this case, uh, two black holes. And so this is a fairly you know, generic uh, prediction of relativity. In principle, the, you know, the Earth orbiting the sun is also emitting gravitational waves. It would just take so long for the Earth to move into the sun through this process that we, we can't possibly observe it in the age of the universe. But with these uh, black hole systems, if they find themselves in these binaries, they, they can undergo these merger events. 
And so the other important point is, is just a sort of, this is again a sort of cartoon, but basically if one of these gravitational waves, if there's two of these merging black holes in some distant galaxy or these two merging stars uh, and the gravitational waves that are coming out during this event uh, you know, pass through uh, the Earth, in principle there are these very tiny uh, distortions of space-time. Uh, this is quite exaggerated in this image, but, um, but fundamentally, <laughs> Fundamentally, uh, if a gravitational wave passes through the Earth, in principle, it's an effect we could uh, detect for reasons I'll talk about now. And so this was the, the basis for the, uh, the LIGO experiment, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. So you have these two, each LIGO detector, Yuri's actually a member of the LIGO collaboration, uh, is an interferometer. It has two uh, uh, long arms, each about three kilometers in length. Uh, and as an interferometer, essentially what it's doing is that you have a laser which you're bouncing back and forth between the two ends of this interferometer. And if there's not a gravitational wave passing through, those two lasers, say, can, you know, destructively interfere when they come back here and, and you get no transmitted uh, signal. Um, but then if you have a gravitational wave passing through, it slightly changes the relative arm length uh, of one arm relative to the other. So you've changed the path length that the laser light is traversing, and then suddenly you get interference, which you can detect. Now, it's much more complicated than this. There's a huge amount of technological development that went into this for, for decades to try to, to achieve the precision um, and it's actually truly impressive that, that they're able to measure a difference in the path length between these arms smaller than the size of an atom over these three kilometer distances and therefore be very sensitive to measuring the passage of a gravitational wave through the detectors. And there's two of these detectors. In fact, that's also important because then you can see if something is real, if you see it in the one in, in Livingston, Louisiana, and one in Hanford, Washington State, um, you, you, know, you know it's real. Okay. Um, and there are, as I'll talk about, there are other gravitational wave observatories being developed on the Earth, but the, the two that are sort of in, in lead contention are the LIGO ones. And so as I mentioned earlier, when you have two black holes uh, coalescing, they're a source of gravitational waves. And if you solve uh, Einstein's equations on a computer, you can make a very accurate prediction for what that gravitational waveform should look like. Um, and this was exactly what LIGO saw in 2015 for the first time. It saw uh, a gravitational waves from two uh, merging black holes. Now, if you hear, if you could audibly hear these gravitational waves, because as I mentioned earlier, the two objects are orbiting one another. As they get closer together, they emit stronger gravitational waves, and the whole process sort of accelerates and runs away to high frequencies. And so if you could hear this, um, you would hear something that sounds like a chirp. Uh, because it's, it's increasing in frequency and amplitude. Uh, uh, and, and, and so this is roughly what, if you could hear it, I'm going <laughs> to go off there now. So, so ultimately, uh, uh, this discovery led, of course, to the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics uh, um, uh, to, to Barish Lorne and, and, and Ray Weiss. Um, okay. All right. So LIGO then, dis so LIGO discovered these uh, uh, in their... their their first observing run, um, and then in their second observing, well, I'll come back to that in a second, but um, basically what I wanted to say is LIGO's now been progressively increasing its sensitivity. It's been detecting more and more of these uh, merging black hole systems. This is just showing a sort of rogues gallery of the first five or so that they detected, but they've now actually detected about o over 40 or roughly 40 of these merging black hole binaries. And so we're seeing what happens, you know, we're seeing mergers between black holes that have, you know, between, you know, 10 times the mass of our sun uh, uh, to things up maybe even up to 50 times the mass of our sun. And it's a, it's a big open question exactly how is the universe making these binaries? Well, you know, why are some of these black holes so, so massive compared to the black holes that we're aware of in our own galaxy? Um, and of course, when two black holes merge, they form an, you know, they form a, a more massive black hole. Um, and so we're, you know, we're just starting to learn about the population of these sources. But what I want to say with this slide is not that we're detecting a lot of black holes, but, but to our knowledge, as of yet, we have, none of these have emitted any, any light. We haven't, we've tried to point telescopes at these a few times, but we haven't seen any, any bright light coming out after them. Um, and in some sense, this is not unexpected. If you don't have any other material around the black holes when they're merging, you know, only matter can emit couples electromagnetically. <laughs> You know, in some sense, black holes are pure space-time. And so it's not so surprising, even though we've detected many black holes, we hadn't seen any light from them. 
Um, but the situation changes if I don't have two black holes, but I have two of these neutron stars, these objects that are made of actual material. And for the very same reasons, general relativity, if you have a, a binary of two neutron stars, it will also coalesce through gravitational waves and also produce a chirp signal. It will be higher in frequency because the mass of the system is, is, is smaller. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, you're going to get a, a very strong collision between these two stars, a physical collision which can produce a lot of debris and a lot of which can radiate a lot of light. And that's going to be what I'm, I'm mainly uh, describing uh, so in, in what follows. And so, oh, this is loud. pause it here for a second. <laughs> um, and so LIGO didn't see any merging neutron stars for its first uh, observing run at advanced sensitivity when it detected the first black hole. It didn't see any through most of its second observing run, and then near the end of its second observing run uh, in, in late 2017, or sorry, August 2017, at about 8.40 in the morning, this was uh, what it detected. So what you're seeing here is uh, frequency versus time. And this is actually a, a Italian observatory, Virgo, that had come online just a, a week or so, a few weeks prior. And you'll start seeing these, these tracks uh, appearing first in the Livingston detector and then in Hanford. It's just, it's just showing you that there's power and that power is moving quicker and quicker to high frequency. And so, um, they, 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 so this, was, this was the first, uh, oh, first detection of emerging neutron star system. I'm sorry if you didn't hear it at the end, but there was a whoop, a little a chirp there uh, uh, in the end. Um, um, and so this was a much lower mass binary than the black holes that they had seen previously, which was quite exciting uh, because, as I mentioned, we might have light from these. And so what happened, you know, so the other thing, you know, if you're an astronomer on the ground, you know there was a merging neutron star. You'd like to know where in the sky it came from so you can point your telescope at that part of the sky. And so the way LIGO does localization on the sky for the most part is through triangulation by basically timing the arrival of the gravitational waves in different observatories across the globe and using that arrival time information with, with some other information to, to determine the sky position. So for instance, if it arrives a slightly later in, in Washington, then Louisiana, then you know, and, and you see it at a different time in, in, in Italy, then you, know, you sort of pinpointed where it's at. Where it's at. Um, and so in this particular case, the neutron star merger was uh, pinpointed towards the Hydra uh, constellation of Hydra. It's actually over, I think, the Indian Ocean uh, at that time. Okay, so this, this immediately launched a, a, a follow-up campaign. Basically, everyone in the world who had a telescope, as I mentioned, tried to point it to, to that part of the sky. And so I'm going to kind of give you a timeline of what happened during those first uh, half a day and, and the discoveries that pinpointed where this merging neutron star system came from. And so it's going to involve both traditional sort of you know, ground-based telescopes like, like optical observatories in Chile. I've shown a few examples here that were involved in the discovery. And also space-based satellites such as NASA's uh, Fermi Gamma Ray satellite. So let me just go through the, the, the... So what happened first, actually, two seconds after the two neutron stars met, there was a burst of gamma rays detected by the Fermi satellite from that part of the sky. It was also detected by Euro, uh, the, the European Union... or Sorry, European Space Agency's integral satellite... Uh, which, which localized it here. And then the two LIGO uh, observatories uh, provided their localization. It was either up there or down here. And then Virgo, the Italian observatory, chimed in and said, it's right there. Out to the distances of the source, there were only about 30 galaxies in this part of the sky. And astronomers from the ground di diligently uh, tiled through all of these galaxies. And this particular one, NGC 4993, had about 130 million light years. Uh, they detected the uh, fading optical glow from this explosion. And so that's what I'm going to tell you. The rest of my talk is going to be explaining how we almost immediately understood what we were seeing because theory had been working on how these events should appear and, and that, that, that the theory worked out in this case. Okay, so anyways, I'll show you. So basically, this is the event. So this is the galaxy. And, 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 of course, people took observations uh, the first night and the next night and the next night. So you're seeing the fading of this uh, little point here. The first night, it's very bright, and then it sort of fades over the ensuing week. And this is unlike any stellar explosion we've seen before. We see things called supernova, which are exploding stars, but they don't fade uh, away so quickly. And so this immediately told us this was unlike anything that we had seen before. So what I want to do, as I mentioned, is try to describe to you the physics of what happens when two neutron stars merge. 
and how we could understand the light that we saw. So here I'm going to show you, this is a numerical simulation of two merging neutron stars, uh, again, by solving Einstein's equations and hydrodynamics. Uh, you can follow the merger process near the end of the in-spiral to see the collision of the two stars, the ejection of some material into space by the, by the shocks between them. And in the center, you have this very rapidly rotating neutron star, but, but it becomes unstable as it loses ma angular momentum and collapses into a black hole. But the, 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 and this, this happens in you know, probably a matter of, of milliseconds or tens or hundreds of milliseconds. Um, and so at the end of the day, I'll show you this movie one more time, might as well. Um, so again, you're seeing the two neutron stars. As they get closer together, there will be matter uh, ejected from the outer Lagrange points of the binary. You'll see the collision, the creation of a cloud, and uh, the formation initially of a, of a temporarily stable neutron star, but it's radiating angular momentum and energy uh, and ultimately succumbs to gravity and forms a black hole. Uh, but that black hole is surrounded by a, a torus of material which contains maybe a tenth the mass of our sun. And it turns out that black holes in this context, if you try to feed them at an extremely high rate, if you take a you know, a tenth the mass of the sun and put, plop them down around a black hole, it turns out that the black holes are, are kind of fussy eaters. Uh, some of the material ends up in the horizon, but a lot of it, there's, there's different types of turbulence which act in these accretion disks, and a lot of it ends up getting uh, ejected in a wind from or an outflow from the accretion disk. Um, uh, I could go into more detail about how this works, but, but ultimately the picture is that a lot of mass would be ejected during this merger, both when the two neutron stars initially collide and in the subsequent seconds as it feeds off of the remaining debris. And so this material uh, is coming from a neutron star. As I mentioned earlier, neutron stars are mostly neutrons, so it's extremely rich in neutrons. And you're, you're ejecting it, uh, it out into space. It's decompressing from enormously high densities. And these are the precisely the conditions you want if you want to create the heaviest elements. So what happens is as your material is expanding, say, out of the accretion disk, this is from a simulation following the trajectories of matter ejected, um, very quickly your protons get together with your neutrons and form some seed nuclei, which are akin to iron, say. But these seed nuclei are now bathed. There's so many neutrons that they're bathed in this bath of neutrons, which then bombard the, the, the seed nuclei at a high rate and create these very heavy uh, radioactive isotopes. So I'll show you this in a bit more detail, but this is the cartoon picture. This is called the rapid neutron pr capture process, the R process. Um, and, and this is one site uh, where our simulations say it can take place in nature. So this is probably one of the more technical uh, slides I have in my whole talk. This is the chart of a nucleide. So this is proton number and neutron number. And what we're doing is we're following a single fluid element as it expands and we're following all the different nuclear reactions. Uh, neutron captures, photodissociations, alpha, beta decays, fission. There's a lot of messy physics here. Um, but we're following a single fluid element as it decompresses. So the temperature and density will drop from enormously high values, from almost nuclear densities, temperatures in excess of billion degrees uh, down to much lower values. And in this process, we will create these elements. So this, the colors are showing you the abundances of these isotopes in the, in the chart of the nucleides. So neutron captures move you this way and capture neutrons, whereas a beta decay moves you at constant mass uh, back up that way. And it's through, subsequent, it's, it's through a number of neutron captures and subsequent beta decays that we, move, we wiggle our way up to the heaviest elements. And then at the end of the day, we, the, up at the top is showing you a sort of accounting of the abundances as a function of the atomic mass number. And then if you want, the, the blue points are, are the abundances of these elements in our solar system. So we're expanding. We're capturing neutrons, beta decaying, capturing neutrons, and going all the way up to these heavy elements. After about a second or so now, we finally run out of neutrons. We've created this whole distribution of nuclei, which are now decaying back to the stable valley over the course of hours and weeks and months and years. And then ultimately, we end up with a distribution of nuclei, which in this particular case doesn't look terribly different than that in our own solar system. And this is just one fluid element you have to, of course, all the different fluid elements uh, ejected will experience different thermodynamic conditions. Um, so the important point for the uh, signal we saw is that this material you're ejecting into space is radioactive. Okay. So if, it, if, it, if the material was just expanding adiabatically, it would be so cold by the time it expanded enough that we could, we could see through it 
that it, we wouldn't be able to see this at such large distances. But, but this material is radioactive, and that keeps it hot, keeps it glowing. Um, so this is the radioactive power as a function of time. Um, and so if you had a single isotope, just like nickel-56 is a single radioactive isotope, um, you know, its radioactive power is constant, and then on the half-life it decays exponentially. We all know that. But here you have hundreds of isotopes. So the one with a short half-life decays to one with a slightly longer half-life, which decays to one with a slightly longer half-life. And when you add them in aggregate, you get a radioactive heating, which is something more like a, a power law in time. Um, and of course, you know, you have to ask the question, well, you know, so, so, this, so this, you, you're producing this radioactive power. It's thermalizing that energy uh, in the ejecta, and the ejecta is gl glowing as a result. That's the basic picture. Um, and so, in fact, the, the critical window we care about is actually hours to days after the merger. We don't really care that there's a lot of radioactive heating going on in the first few minutes because all of that energy is trapped in the expanding material. It's only after a few hours to a day where that material becomes transparent and we can actually start to see uh, this energy being released. Um, so we made some of the first uh, predictions of how these mergers would appear in this 2010 paper. Um, these were our predictions uh, for the light curve, which by which I mean the luminosity of, of what we would see with an optical telescope versus the time and days after the merger. Um, so again, um, so what we predicted, so, so again, in early times, the ejecta is opaque. You don't get very much light out. But about after a day or so, the ejecta is becoming transparent, and you're starting to see that light come out. Uh, and then it sort of decays in a way that follows the input of heating from radioactivity. So, it's a, so what we found with these models was that the, the, was that the peak luminosity would, would be about a day after the merger. It would be a few by 10 to the 41 or 10 to the 42 ergs per second. This is about a thousand times more luminous than events we call nova in our own galaxy. So we gave these events the name kilonova, and it's now sort of taken off and largely used by this, by this community. What we really should have called them is radioactive waste nova, so that's essentially what the physics is. <laughs> I'm creating a bunch of radioactive waste and expelling it into space, and as it expands, it gets brighter, um, as we can see more and more of that material. The photon, basically the point is the photons you're creating at depth have to be able to escape, and it gets easier to escape as the medium dilutes. And that's what causes this to rise and then to fall uh, following the radioactive power law. Okay. So again, going back to what we uh, saw in the first week after this discovery by following LIGO's uh, merger. Um, uh, so astronomers, I mean, every telescope, <laughs> like I think they the estimate was a third of professional astronomers were, were involved in this discovery. And so, so they have amazing data on this event, uh, very accurate uh, multicolor photometry, if you know what that means. And so we're able to, to constrain this, this luminosity of the event um, in fact, our original models from 2010 did a very good job of, of explaining uh, the data, at least, to the, to, at least for the first uh, week or so. I could get into the details of why they don't agree after that point. So this is showing you that model I showed you on the previous page, and then the blue points are the, the data that the telescopes uh, measured. And so I was immediately convinced um, that we were, f in fact, seeing a, our process a nuclear... Uh, uh, we were seeing evidence for the direct creation of these heavy elements and its synthesis and ejection into space uh, following this event. Okay, but there's more uh, 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 that, that I want to tell you. Some some more uh, uh, details. Not only did we learn, you know, so by measuring how bright this event is, we can infer how much of this material was created. I'll come to that in a second. And actually, also by measuring the colors, how blue or red the emission is, that tells us something critical about which types of elements were created. And I don't, uh, in this type of lecture, want to go into the details. I'll simply say that this event showed very strong color evolution. During the first day, it was extremely blue, hot in its colors. And over the first week, it became cooler and redder in its colors. And our detailed modeling of this uh, uh, has developed a picture where we think there were discrete uh, portions of the ejecta that came out uh, uh, at different times. And they're, they're actually uh, a red and a blue part of this expanding cloud. I'll come back to what this means in a second. Um, but basically, um, well, wait, wait a second here. Um, uh, I think it will appear. I guess maybe not completely. 
you, you see very quickly is there's this sort of blue, blue, blue material and then this sort of red cloud that comes out. Um, and, and to get a little bit more quantitative about what I'm talking about here, um, uh, basically we think we saw evidence for the synthesis of fairly light elements, uh, for instance, xenon, but we also saw in this red color, it actually tells us something about uh, the fact that we were forming some of the heaviest elements. It turns out that the bottom of the periodic table, the lanthanide and actinide nuclei, have enormously high optical opacities, which block out the blue light. So if we see this very red color, it's telling us, it, it, it turns on later, it's telling us that the inner material ejected from this event contains uh, some of the heaviest elements. So this was very exciting. We'd found uh, a site for the creation of these heaviest elements the first time. This, this goes back to a, a, a paper by the Burbages, Hoyle, and Fowler in the, in the 50s, where they, they, they postulated there must be some place in nature which, where this R process can happen, where it's neutron-rich enough. Um, and, and they identified actually many different, you know, basically went through the periodic table, said this comes from this process, this comes from this process. Other than the R process, all the previous processes had found their sites in nature. And so we're sort of completing the picture um, Burbage, Burbage, Hoyle, and Fowler by saying, you know, this is where the heaviest elements are formed. Um, and so for this particular event, 17817, by modeling its light curve, we're able to infer things like how much material was produced. So we think about 5% of our sun's mass was ejected from this event. If you were to translate that into the amount of individual elements, uh, about 10 times our Earth's mass yeah, of our sun's mass, yes, yes, yeah, it's just way astronomical. <laughs> we, we usually, yeah, our sun's mass, yeah. So, so a, typical, a typical neutron star is about uh, one and a half times our, our sun's mass. So we're saying if you sort of merge two neutron stars, about 5% of the total system mass was, <laughs> or a little more than that was, a uh, little less than that was ejected, yeah. And so this single event, we think, produced 10 times the Earth's mass of gold, 50 times the Earth's mass in platinum, and five times the Earth's mass in uranium. Now, these are extremely rare events. They only happen in our galaxy every 10,000 years or so, uh, which is you know, why we don't overproduce these elements in, 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 the, in the universe. Um, but, but nevertheless, this event produced enough material in this single event that we think it's possible or likely that must, uh, most or all of the precious metals on the, the Earth came from mergers that happened prior to the formation of our sun. So these mergers are happening in our galaxy before the sun was even formed. This material is ejected. It will go out and mix with the interstellar medium. It will end up in the next generation of stars. And so we think you know, there were quite a few of these mergers that, that contributed to the platinum on my wedding band, for instance. It's quite exciting to think this was within a few gravitational radii of a black hole at one point. Um, um, <laughs> where the most material in the universe is sort of a more, more dull existence, I guess. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, anyways, I think. We, so, anyways, I guess the, 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 the upshot is that you know this 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 is a mystery where these elements came from you know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, and I think you now we have a pretty good contender at least. And so, various people have revised this uh, periodic table since then, and so. What before said they all came from supernova, they were in blue here. Uh, now th they've been all attributed to uh, merging neutron stars. Although I should say, with one event, we can hardly draw definitive conclusions that there aren't other places in nature where these elements are produced. But, um, um, but we've changed the periodic table, at least we can say that. OK, so let me just give you, this is sort of NASA's uh, PR diagram of everything that happened in this single uh, neutron star merger. So I'm going to show you this video. I didn't spend much time talking about the burst of gamma rays that came out in the first two seconds of the event. We think that was a jet of relativistic material that was made when the black hole formed. Uh, it's a bit detailed to go into, into that for this talk, but you'll see it coming out first. Uh, and I want to explain it ahead of time. So the two merging neutron stars will form a black hole, which makes a jet. The jet comes out and makes gamma rays. And then, it, and then the, there's this cloud of, of, of this heavy elements which come out. So there's the jet, and there's this cloud, which starts out blue and then turns uh, red, <laughs> as we're seeing deeper in the material. It turns out that this jet that made the gamma rays goes off and hits the interstellar medium. Uh, that produces X-rays and radio synchrotron emission, which we also saw from this event. Um, 
So the single event was quite exciting for, for astronomy. So my colleague, uh, uh, who was working on this very c uh, closely with me, uh, sent me this email. Uh, he said, I, I came across an interesting passage in a Star Trek book. Um, and what it says, uh, it said, colliding neutron stars have never been observed by Starfleet, as this event is thankfully rare. The amount of energy released in a possible neutron star collision would be enough to sterilize all life within a few thousand light years and cause extinction events and thousand more. Um, so what my colleague said is, this is great. We are 400 years ahead of Starfleet scientifically. <laughs> Since we've seen a neutron star merger. <laughs> we've seen a neutron star merger, you know, which means all these other things, warp drives, the utopian post-scarcity society, our economy are right around the corner. Um, and we have 400 years of the you know, data from 40 years of the future on the impact of Kilanova on habitability. So, so these events do happen in our galaxy, but they're not the most deadly to, to life. Supernova are much more frequent and, and probably more deadly to life. But, um, okay, but I just want to say that this, this field is extremely bright, and, and think about it from the gravitational wave uh, side, loud. Um, and, and that's because these LIGO interferometers, the one in Washington and Livingston, are working to improve their sensitivity. As they get more sensitive, they can see uh, neutron star mergers or black holes from a greater volume of the universe. Uh, and so they, they see them more frequently. Uh, the uh, Italians, this Virgo detector is, is getting uh, approaching the sensitivity of the LIGO detectors. And they're adding a, they're, they're worldwide efforts to add additional gravitational wave observatories to this, uh, to this array. There's a, one being built, uh, actually coming online already in Japan, called Kagra. And LIGO has uh, a replica of, of, I believe, the Hanford uh, interferometer, which is in storage, but they're moving it to India. And, and you, you want to create a worldwide network of these detectors so you can obtain a better sky position, because again, you're triangulating the arrival. There are various reasons to do this, but one of them is, uh, is, to, get, is, is to be able to, to do this, this, uh, this multi-messenger uh, uh, gravitational waves. So we're going to see more events, because these detectors are getting more sensitive. They're seeing more of the universe. Uh, by, uh, well, I have 2021 here, which is next year, but, but by their, their fourth observing run, uh, we expect they will see these merging neutron stars once a month rather than you know, once a year. Um, and so that means we're, we're going to, we, basically we have a particle collider in the sky. Instead of slamming particles together and sees what's coming flying out, we're slamming neutron stars together and seeing what comes flying out. And, and so... Uh, you know, we're going to see similar, otherwise similar events from different angles, which will allow us to test our models. We're going to see what happens when more or less massive neutron stars merge. So maybe if the two neutron stars are more massive when they merge, the black hole will form faster, and that will have some effect on what we see. Because if you, if you form a more massive object, it's, it's going to gravity stronger. It wants to collapse to a black hole faster. Um, so we're going to learn a lot about these and be able to test uh, uh, our, our predictions with them um, and also be able to test whether these are ubiquitously sites of forming heavy elements or maybe only some of them form these heavy elements. Um, um, and so we also could, we also hope, or maybe LIGO has already detected, there are rumors uh, that they detected the merger of a neutron star with a stellar mass black hole. And that's quite exciting because, you know, maybe... Uh, the neutron star will be swallowed whole by the black hole. We won't see anything come out. Or maybe the, neutron, the black hole's tidal force will be, tidal field will be strong enough to tear apart the neutron star before it gets, you know, enters the, the horizon, and we would get a lot of material ejected in very bright light. Um, and so we'll be able to test the, you know, potentially test whether, you know, black holes have surfaces or this kind of equivalent thing. We already kind of know they don't, but we'll be able to test properties of neutron stars and some interesting properties of black holes if we can detect whether or not neutron star and black hole mergers produce similar events to what we saw from this merger of neutron star. Now, basically, uh, uh, finished, um, I just want to say that, you know, we have a whole group of, of people at Columbia and other places uh, working on this. As I mentioned, it was a worldwide effort, uh, astronomers across the globe, uh, and I'm really thankful for, for all the support I've received uh, 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 from the Simons Foundation and from other, uh, other support to, uh, to push forward this research as we enter this new uh, exciting era of uh, multi-messenger uh, gravitational wave uh, astrophysics. Uh, thank you.